Mm. The new Vinehander album is out, and right now, let's, let's look. It's, uh, you guys are awesome for, for checking it out on the entire Bandcamp website. And if you're not familiar with Bandcamp, it's a pretty damn big website. Let me scroll down and take a look here where we are right now. Oh, man, we're number three. Well, what happened? We were number two earlier. We're number three on Bandcamp. Well, I, I would say that immediately after this comes out, it's going to be, oh my goodness. Well, we, we were up to number two. That is really high on Bandcamp. The last album made it to number 13 on Bandcamp. So we've got two albums. I don't know what they are, but they both have parental advisories. Mine doesn't because there's no lyrics, but mentally it's pretty mature. <laughs> if you think about the music, it's pretty rough. <laughs> I have no idea. And we've got these idiots here who are trying to be ironic with their Starbucks and their American flag and all that crap. But no, guys. Oh, also, the album artwork is, is temporary, so just just thanks, guys. That's all. Thanks for getting it up there. If it only gets to number two or three, I'll be happy. Speed and power is what they're saying with the new stunning 5-inch display on the Nexus. So we got a 5-inch Nexus, Nexus five coming is out. out. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's out today. You can buy it now in the Play Store. Android 4.4 KitKat. Their names, they've got to stop doing the candy names. But I guess it's appropriate since it's the day after Halloween to be used, having a Kit Kat in your pocket. Five inches, that's huge. I mean, we've got a seven inch Nexus tablet. And I mean, five inches, is that, does that make the tablet irrelevant? Well, no, um, the, the picture, they've actually gotten the, the screen really close to the edge. So I don't think it's going to feel like a five inch phone. It's going to feel a little bit smaller? I think so. But I mean, with something this size, do you think someone's going to buy both? I mean, really, you, if you get this, do you need the 7-inch tablet? Yes. <laughs> you need all of them. I need all the tablets. They've also got a wireless charging thing, which looks really awesome. I think I want to get that because I've got the Nexus 7. Um, a new wireless charging thing. So but it's 350 bucks with no contract, right? $350 with no contract. It's available on all carriers except Verizon. So what's that about? Well, we did a little digging, and it turns out Verizon still hasn't okayed the Nexus 7 on their network either and so like if you go to verizon and you get a sim card and you put it in the nexus 7 it works or at least there's reports of it working on the internet but if you call verizon or you go into the store and it's like hey i'd like to get a sim card for my nexus 7 they will not give you one but if you just say give me a sim card for data purposes i'm not going to tell you what the device is or you lie to them they'll give you a sim card that apparently works and so now the situation is the nexus 5 is out and it supports lte but google is saying well it doesn't work on verizon and so it probably does work on Verizon. That's probably just Google saying that Verizon is not going to help you get it working, which is absolutely ridiculous, and a violation of the contract that Verizon entered into in order to get access to the LTE spectrum. Part of the deal was they wouldn't limit the devices you use with your plan, and here they are. <laughs> they love messing with everything. And they love, I love breaking the rules. how blatantly and dishonest they... they are about things. They're like, oh, we've got to certify that. Well, it's been two months, and they keep saying that the Nexus 7 is going to be certified soon. So, yeah, I mean, two months, that's like 10% of the lifetime of a telephone. Okay, the question really here is why would they do this? Like, what, what good does it do them? They can't put their crapware on it. Ah, they're pissed off because they can't install their bloatware. Verizon, stop it. Stop it. Have you seen the time, Wendell? Uh-oh, is it Rant 30 already? It's already Rant 30. And you know why it's Rant 30? Because the internet speeds in America suck. It's like some of the worst... Well, the speeds don't suck, but the prices for the speeds are absolutely ridiculous. And we may have a big project coming up on this, but right now let's talk about the speeds and the price that you have to pay. Um, also, I want to note that this is really bad in Australia, and we, we... I mean, I can't say we feel your pain because it's probably worse over there, but it's not really on this chart here. I don't see anything in, in on the chart. I guess it's an order of importance by city, and Australia didn't make the cut. I feel bad now. But anyway, uh, when you look at how much you're paying for the speed you get, San Francisco, New York, D.C. are the top. I think some of the companies in America have something to say about this. So let's let's take a look at what they have to say. Now, Verizon said that they provide a good value Triple play, Fios bundle, it's 500 mega, uh, megabits per second, and it's roughly 100 to $125 a month. So they're quoting that. Now, they're not quoting, um, you know, the different prices for taxes and fees and all that nonsense that costs a lot of money. And they're also not quoting the fact that you typically have to spend money to rent equipment to get that speed. 
So they're missing out on a lot of that, but still 500 for 100 to $125 a month is not bad. And again, that's only in select mar markets. We've only been conditioned to think that's not bad. There are people in Estonia that just coughed up a lung laughing at you for saying that's not bad. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, there's people with twice that speed that are paying the equivalent of $30 a month. I really like the people that hop on the comments of the uh, the YouTube things. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm come connecting from Sweden. I have a gigabit and I pay 12 kroner a month. And it's like, damn, that's like three cents. How do you do that? <laughs> They're like, well, they understand that, uh, you know, our Internet speeds are very important for our businesses and it helps our economy shoot through the roof if everyone has access to extremely high speed Internet. Let's check in and see what Comcast has to say. Comcast reminds us all that they have increased their speeds 12 times in the last 11 years, and they now offer 105 megabits per second to more than 50 million homes. But what they did not tell us is that in order to get the 105 megabits per second in most uh, areas in the country, you have to sign up for their triple play. So you have to get their fancy TV phone and all that stuff. So that's like an extra, you know, hundred and something dollars. The phone's like 49 bucks. The TV's like a hundred and something. And then in some markets, like where I am, you, you still can't get 105 unless you also get the premium package with HBO and Showtime. And the reason they do this is because they know that if you get the super high speed internet, that you're, you can cheat on, on cable TV and you won't even need cable TV. So they'll for, they force you to have that package so that they don't have to compete with themselves. This is why the FCC, one of the reasons why the FCC was originally created, and if you look at the history of the FCC, this situation is exactly the situation where the FCC would intervene in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. But they're not intervening today because they no longer have the power to do so. But yes, this is, this is an abuse of their position, and this is a place where the government should step in and curb stomp this company for doing this. Well, you know, it can't all be bad. Let's take a look at Time Warner Cable and see what they have to say. They said this, their entry-level pricing for broadband was the second lowest in the world. Second lowest in the world. What they do not tell us in that statement from their idiot PR people is what speed we're talking about here. We don't know if we're talking about, you know, like 56K. We don't know what, what speed is that. What speed is it and what price is it? I know what speed it is. It's the exact speed that pisses you off enough to force you to upgrade to a more expensive package. That's exactly what speed it is. Yes. Well, <laughs> the cable companies, not just cable companies specifically, a lot of ISPs do this, but they almost have traffic shaping implemented to be the worst possible traffic shaping. Because 5 megabit, even if you've got you know 5 megabit of upload on your cable connection, the traffic shaping in there seems to almost always be the worst case scenario so that if you really do want to use the full five megabits you've been allocated, you're looking at latencies of three, 400 milliseconds. And that's if you're not like in an incredibly populated area. If you're somewhere with a gazillion people and you're connecting through cable, well, just know that you're not going to get what's advertised. And when you call them to complain, they're going to read two words to you. They're going to say, look at your contract. It says up to up to 25 megabits per second. It doesn't say 25, it says up to. So maybe bursting on a good day, if it's lucky and the sun comes out and Jesus comes back, you'll get 25. Other than that, screw you. So <laughs> Their slowest speed is four times faster than dial-up. It's like, what? <laughs> what? I mean, we, we can play a hell of a game of Doom 2, and that's about all. <laughs> maybe browse the internet for... Um, Actually, your, your latency with a modem would probably be better on the Doom 2, which is probably the part that'll matter. So I think yeah. I'd probably take modem in that case. <laughs> yeah, I probably would too. <laughs> Plus I mean, how the, sad is that? The nostalgic sound effects and all that. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. This is, and I think the problem here is that politicians just don't understand how bad this is. I mean, this is like, you know, having running water that has, you know, you, you've got a one in a hundred chance of catching salmonella. And these companies are like, well, that's really good. You know, one in a hundred people getting salmonella. That's great. That means 99% of people are getting good, clean water. Self-driving cars are going to save lives. In fact, uh, they're, they're going to cut down on injuries by 90%, and the U.S. economy is going to save $450 billion. Can you imagine what it would do for uh, somewhere like China, where there's just a ton of cars, um, you know, Russia, the, the U.K., just all over the world, self-driving cars are going to save a lot of money and a lot of lives. And also, you won't need a designated driver anymore. How about that? You guys could just do all your illicit things and drink until you can't see anymore and as long as you can crawl to your freaking car and tell it to go home you'll be all right you'll probably wake up in the that's back gonna, seat in a pile of vomit but hey you'll get home you know that's going to change something that nobody's really talking about and that's the poorer areas of the country everybody owns a car and 
which is sort of counterintuitive because it's like poor areas everybody owns a car and it's like yeah because everything else is cheaper rent's cheaper food's cheaper everything else is cheaper everybody drives everywhere and you know in a rural area it's not uncommon that you would drive 30 or 40 minutes by distance not by time and traffic to get to the grocery store and so in those areas it's probably going to transform things so uh it's it's these, these are not like ready yet they're still working out some of the bugs but i mean some of the tests have been very positive i think the google car went or drove all over the place and had like one fender bender or something and it was because it was parked in a parking lot or something like that so, that, so that's it was parked in a parking promising. lot and somebody hit it while it was parked yeah uh, facebook is now going to start logging your cursor movement they're going to log how long you hover over top of things it's just they're going to be collecting all of the data. It's pretty much like they're going to be recording what you're doing on the screen. And they're going to give this over to marketers. So this technology already exists. There's already companies out there that do this. And then they harvest that data and say like, hey, this guy didn't click on your advertisement, but his cursor was like there for 2.4 seconds. And maybe he was thinking about it. So I don't see this as being any more invasive uh, than what Facebook already does. I mean, do you see anything... Uh, outside no, of the normal with this or it looks like pretty standard issue marketing drivel i'm sure that they'll use it to analyze ways that they can manipulate us into actually doing things that, that we don't really want to do but they make us do yeah Tenfold like we, hat. They, they take the data <laughs> and find out that people hang out in this area of the screen a lot so they start putting all the junk right there and then we'll <laughs> and then we'll, we'll we'll be trained to hang out over here and they'll keep moving the junk around to wherever we wherever we hang out yeah i bet that's what they'll do that's exactly what they're going to do. It's like, oh, you want to see your friend's newborn baby? Well, first you're going to have to watch this two-minute commercial from Johnson & Johnson. <laughs> Man, I can't wait. I don't use Facebook really much anyway, except for when I go on there to the tech syndicate thing and say, hey, here's a thing. So it's, go to it's Facebook. It's going to happen. Yeah. Actually, you know, I've got to give Facebook credit. LinkedIn has been more evil than Facebook, and I, I figured in the race for revenues that Facebook would be doing all the things first, but it, it seems like LinkedIn is actually doing all the hideously evil things first. Really? LinkedIn, huh? I mean, they... Yeah, well, they had a new app that they released, and if you saw, if you use the, the iOS app, it makes all of your email go through LinkedIn's outbound email servers. And it's like, what? That's pretty interesting. That's so they can mine your email for people that you talk to automatically and then tell you about them. This is why, I, and it really, I really should be on LinkedIn. I'm not on LinkedIn. Yeah, people are always wondering, like, why aren't you on LinkedIn, man? Hmm. Yeah, no. That's disturbing. LinkedIn is a hideously evil company. Speaking of hideously <laughs> evil, the bad BIOS virus. So this virus, it attacks the BIOS. It, it attacks Linux, OS X, and Windows, and it's... It pretty much can survive nuclear fallout. It's it, <laughs> okay. You, well, people, it's, they, they, these guys they wipe their computer and then like they, you know, turn it back on, and the first symptom is usually like the CD-ROM or the optical disc just stops working, and then after that, more and more things start disappearing, and it's just weird. But it 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 survives a wipe. How how is it doing this? The interesting like the first time I read this story. It really reeks of an inexperienced researcher that doesn't know what they're doing. But then I sort of researched the guy and his history, and he's a sharp guy. He knows what he's doing. This may be one of the most interesting pieces of malware, if it exists, that I've ever seen. And I, initially I was like, there's only like a 20% chance this really exists. But now I'm starting to think that this thing actually probably does exist, and it probably is just as hideously evil as it is in the... In the, uh, in the description, but they're saying that they think that maybe the virus can communicate with other infected machines through like ultrasonic things and speakers. I don't think that's the case. I think they probably just flubbed up a little bit, and it probably is the case that it can be transferred from firmware to firmware or firmware to UEFI, but I'm frustrated because the way to deal with this is to actually use like one of those chip clips like I have and actually clip onto the BIOS and dump the BIOS and then compare it to a known good thing they were saying that you know their macbook was doing a you know a self uefi update and wouldn't boot from the cd and some other things it's like all right that's fine power it off take it apart get a chip clip and read the eprom contents directly and then compare it with an identical macbook that'll help you root it out because they were saying that even in a unplugged system like the registry editor would be disabled and things like that because the root kit was in the bios which is theoretically possible but something this sophisticated has never been confirmed some extra memory because i'm sure something like this can be uh, you know, contained in just a little bit of code, but you'd have to have enough well, space on the actual chip to have a BIOS and this coexisting. 
Well, that's one of the interesting things about UEFI is UEFI is designed with actually these features built in so that when you have an expansion card or you have an add-in card, that they can add some custom code to the UEFI to boot and initialize that card. Uh, UEFI is, is, is a much more sophisticated thing than a BIOS, and, you know, Macs were one of the first things to go to UEFI, and maybe it's not adequ- adequately protected. There's also um, a researcher who uh, modified the um, flash memory that boots up a hard drive controller, and he was able to have persistent malware that existed on mechanical controller of a hard drive. So if we're talking about state-sponsored malware here, that has been demonstrated. It was malware. He created some malware that would survive on a Linux system inside the hidden sectors of a mechanical hard drive that are normally reserved for bad sector remapping, and that was a thing. So if you have that, and it can also infect UEFI, holy crap. And if it is state-sponsored, I, I'd be more willing to believe that it would, you know, activate uh, uh, Bluetooth and then transmit itself that way, or activate it, or activate um, IPv6, even if that's turned off. It, maybe activate that and use that. But I don't think it's like transmitting through the vibrations and speakers and like light waves and all this kind of stuff. That's like no, I don't think so either. So, someone screwed up and then created a ghost story for all that. Yeah, it's probably that it can like a, a faulty USB. Um, descriptor or something can buffer overflow or something goofy like that or some other controller but if this turns out to be true this is going to have deep deep ramifications for general computer security and we may actually see you know an open source uefi to go with everything else and people may go to secure boot to actually secure their machines against this type of attack this is a really sort of interesting attack vector speaking of breaches and hacking and attacking the adobe hack is bigger than previously stated. And I knew it was bigger than previously stated because they always try to downplay things so that you'll feel secure. That's one of the big things that all companies try to do is make sure that all their customers feel secure. The first thing I did, because I am a customer, I have the creative suite, I went and changed um, you know, my passwords and got rid of the credit card that was attached to that, which was kind of a pain in the ass. But now they're saying, you know, hey, these guys, they took all the passwords and they were all encrypted, but now they're now they're saying, well, you know, there, there's a slight chance that they they got the passwords in, in plain text. And if they got the passwords in plain text, that means a lot of bad things because it's a password and an email address. That email address, a lot of people are stupid and they use the same password for multiple accounts. So if you signed up with your Gmail account and you use the same password with your Adobe account as you do on your Gmail account, well, people can log into your, your Gmail and just do anything they want. And if you use it, this is the same email and password for your bank account, go screw yourself. Jump off a bridge. Yay, yeah. thanks, Adobe. <laughs> Way to go, Adobe. Because Adobe was all excited about this online thing. Like, hey, we got all these. Oh, we, we screwed up. I mean, it was a good idea, CC, but man, I'll <laughs> yeah, take my this secure. This plus the BIOS thing is going to be, I mean, it's going to be a cakewalk when Skynet comes. Skynet's just going to take over and crush us. The war's going to be over in two minutes. <laughs> like, this is easy. Look at all these back doors. This is, <laughs> this is easier than the movies. Yeah, Hollywood has much. no idea how easy this really is. Um, this probably should have gone earlier, but Time Warner has reported a, a record quarterly loss of TV subscribers. They're lo- losing Go tons team. and tons of subscribers, <laughs> but they're you know they're gaining uh, subscribers on the uh, internet front at their yeah. at their one megabit per second or whatever their low their lowest tier is. No, that's not what's really happening. But uh, they're they're blaming the CBS blackout. Remember they had that argument with CBS over content or some kind of control. It's all about control anyway. So they had a CBS blackout for a while, and then instead of you know, um, instead of not watching CBS, everyone just went and downloaded it. So it's like, hey, there's no legal option for us. Let's just download it if they wanted to watch CBS that bad. I uh, thought it was interesting because they actually blocked um, uh, CBS. CBS blocked being able to download. Um, the link uh, download stuff the CBS TV shows and things like that yeah there's a big fight going on I don't, I don't I don't really know everything about it but I just think it's a trend that we're going to see a lot more of there's a lot of cord cutters out there if you're a cord cutter yeah cut cords do it here's a prediction I predict that Tom Warner will not transition well from a cable company to an ISP and that they will fight it kicking and screaming and eventually, hopefully, when they screw all that up, they will be replaced by another ISP that is not quite as, you know, they won't undermine their stuff. Cause the, There's only like five or six left is the problem, you know? Yeah. Well, not I, many left. I, think, 
I think that we'll end up with, with something where the internet service is just so crappy, somebody has to intervene somehow, or maybe maybe phone lines will come back, or maybe phone lines will go fiber optic. I mean, you know, can you imagine a 30-something being put in charge of the remnants of AT&T and is like, yeah, we're going to roll out fiber everywhere and control that, and we're going to take over the world because we'll control that. and Because they could. They could. It's important enough to Google that Google's rolling out fiber and, you know, smaller-ish neighborhoods. So, I mean, come on. All right, this is a question for everybody that's watching right now. What company do you think is going to transition um, from a cable pr- provider to um, an ISP, the best or the, the smoothest, I suppose, with the least amount of headaches? Which one do you think is going to do it the most gracefully? I think it'll be Time Warner, Comcast, uh, Verizon, a Sprint. They even they even still around with their. Yeah, I guess they are, right? Sprint Link is actually a Time Warner thing. Like, Sprint and Time Warner are really, really in bed together. Not oh, a lot are. of people okay. know that. They're all cuddly and everything. So, yeah, so, well, yeah, Sprint Link is like the global broadband backbone thing that all the towers run on because uh, the cable's too shitty. So Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to skip the ISO hunt thing. Uh, in Germany, the courts have stopped the largest telecoms plan to... Um, to set up some some caps on their flat rate plan. And this is really, really cool because people with a flat rate plan, they expect to be able to do whatever they want. And the German uh, courts said, you know what? If people have flat rate, they expect to not be capped, so you can't cap them. It's nice to see uh, a government doing something like that. So Yes, that's very nice. I hope to see more of that. I think, I don't know if this is just because... Germany's awesome, or if because they're pissed off at America in general now. I mean, Germany still has a lot of d- junk going on. What's their uh, stupid uh, um, company that takes care of all the the, the music rights? Um, that's like the equivalent of Gemma. The What's that? Is yeah, it Gemma? yeah, Gemma. Yeah, freaking Gemma. They've still got a lot of stupid stuff going on over there, and they've got they do have some mild scale surveillance. They have worked with the NSA in the past, so there's it's not a perfect society, but it seems like they're more forward thinking. Um, and, and they do have better regulations in place than we do in, in America. So how about an Internet that's free of the, um, of the, of the servers, sort of like a mesh net? Uh, we, they, they, there's a lot of people that have been trying to work on this, where it's almost like a peer-to-peer Internet. Tor is kind of like this. You know, the, I read this article, and this kind of strikes me as, as being similar to this, the architecture of Tor. The thing with Tor is that you give up some space on your hard drive. You give up some space on your hard drive. And um, whatever is really popular on the Tor network gets mirrored to your hard drive. And whatever is not really popular on the Tor network eventually vanishes if, you know, enough nodes disappear or whatever. But because of the nature of encryption, you're not really sure what's on your hard drive and, and what's not on your hard drive. That's one of, the, one of the interesting things about Tor. And so this is like, oh, let's make the whole Internet like that, which is an interesting concept. Yeah, but the, the thing that, that worries me is that the, the really obscure stuff, if it's not accessed enough, what if it just goes away? And also the really obscure stuff, suppose it's only hosted on a couple uh, of the smaller uh, servers or whatever, then it's going to take forever well, to access. So I think that, I think that one, one way that I could see this, this is really light on technical details, but it gave me a lot of really cool ideas. And one way that this could be um, sort of done better than Tor is by cryptographically signing the data and letting it be mirrored. See, before SSL had to be everywhere, you could use the fact that none of the traffic was encrypted for good purposes. You could run a proxy that also did caching. And so this is a common setup in businesses, especially that had a slower internet connection. You know, everybody would be checking CNN for the news or whatever, and you would have a caching proxy server in your office that would cache, you know, if somebody went to CNN, it would cache the result. And then if somebody else went to CNN in the next 10 or 15 minutes, instead of hitting CNN again, it would just return from the local cache. You can do that as long as the connection is not encrypted. You can, all, you can already do that kind of thing with PFSense. Just throw a hard drive in there and let it cache your frequently accessed websites. And if, so, if two people try to download the same set of drivers, it'll just grab the other one off the local hard drive. It's, it's great. Right. But that only works for unencrypted communications. And so this, it sounds like they would use encryption to both verify and sort of hide the contents. And if that happens, that would be amazing. I mean, if Netflix or something like this were built on a standardized technology, ISPs would have zero room to complain because if they had a lot of traffic hitting Netflix, these servers could cache the data. Even though it's encrypted, even though they don't know what it is, the rights holders are still protected 
but the data cache would be local, and so that would that would dramatically reduce the amount of internet traffic that had to be spent retrieving these these blocks of data. There are more smart people that are working on things like the other article. Here's a tech data article on a different project that is also using encryption to obfuscate and you know uh, secure traffic from prying eyes. Yeah, you know when we talked to Schneer, Schneer said that um, any technology uh, that makes it more difficult for them to spy is good technology. Yes. And there it wasn't in the thing. I left it out. I didn't think it mattered too much, but it might also be worth mentioning that the uh, Snowden thing that came out this week is that the NSA, uh, the way that the NSA is spying on Google and Yahoo traffic is because they've tapped into the fiber optic lines leaving the data center. So it's and like Google the, the, and Yahoo the muscular are, thing? Is that that's what you're yeah, talking about? Yeah, Google and Yahoo are like, oh, that would be one way they could do that. We didn't know, dot, 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 question mark. And it's like... Yeah. So now Google and Yahoo are, are taking steps to secure, like, even if it, somebody has tapped their fiber optic cable, yeah. they're securing that. Because it's like, you know, why why would we need to encrypt a connection from point A to point B? That's crazy, because there's no way to intercept the traffic from point A to point B unless you climb a telephone pole. And it's well, like, oh. Now they're like, hey, you know, there has been that white van parked at the bottom of the telephone pole every day. <laughs> we, we just never thought much of it. We thought it was a food truck or something. Yeah. <laughs> So bottom line is there are a lot of initiatives, a lot of ideas uh, that are floating around out there and a lot of projects that are taking shape to, I guess, change the way the Internet works so that it's more difficult for the NSA and other parties to spy. The analogy I liked was uh, if you see an armored car now on the street, you know there must be something valuable inside. But if everybody drove an armored car, then we can go, you know, looting armored cars all day long, and I might only get something valuable once in a while, as opposed to every time of, uh, you know, an armored car goes by. And encryption is a lot like that. Well, you know, this is something Thomas Drake said at the uh, at the event. He said that they have a hoarding complex. So, I mean, what if every if everyone has an armored car and they've got a com- they've got a hoarding complex? It's like a mental disorder. They, you know, they, they ignore all, all the really important data, like when Russia called and said, hey, there's some dudes in Boston, you should watch them. They're like, we don't have time to watch these guys. We're, try, we're busy trying to collect everything. So what if they just expanded, spent billions more to try to, you know, collect data on everything? That's, that's what I'm afraid would happen. And I feel like a lot of these technologies are just going to force them to spend more tax dollars because they're gonna, their hoarding complex is going to go crazy and then they're going to be like, we have to figure out a way to get all of this stuff. We, we've got to figure out some way to like, you know, stop them at the same time. You know, while, while we're doing one thing over here, we've got to figure out a way to make them chill out just a little bit. You know? I saw an interesting, perhaps constitutional argument that was... You know, you people that are using technology should not have more rights and freedoms than people that are not using technology. And what they mean by that is if you if you encrypt your device or you do something like that that would defeat attempts at surveillance or coercion or whatever, um, you shouldn't be more protected under the law than somebody that elected not to do that. And but that's exactly the situation that we have today is that you know it's not illegal for you to do these things, but at the same time, you know, you, you can be spied upon and your, your data can be seized or whatever. And there are no ramifications if your data is encrypted. But if it's not encrypted, then it can only hurt you. So why would you, why would you not just encrypt everything? So somebody that has encrypted stuff is more, uh, has more rights under the law, in effect, than somebody that doesn't, which is, which is a crazy position to be in. I mean, it, it, you know, certain inalienable rights and all that. Silent Circle and, and Lavabit, they're coming together to create a new uh, encrypted email project called Dark Mail. So Lavabit, you know, they, they uh, opted to close their doors. They were the email service that Snowden may have been using, and I think he was actually using Lavabit. It's a very secure encrypted email service, and, uh, you know, the, the government powers that be came to him and said, hey, we, we want, we give us all that stuff, give it, give it all to us. And he was like, nope, and he shut his doors instead. But now there's a new initiative going on. Do you think that the government will allow this to happen? Well, I think that there's not a lot they can do to stop it for the moment. But, you know, will new laws be written and will there be freak out? And, you know, will the next terrorist incident be turned into an opportunity to quash this kind of technology? That remains to be seen. Well, you know, did they have any uh, legal grounds to come in and, and tell Lavabit in the first place to give over all this stuff? They didn't really. But they did. Well, it's being that's being worked out in the courts right now. I mean, under the law, maybe they do. I mean, everything... 
everything that every tyrant has done in history has been technically legal under the laws of their country at the time, this may be no different. Well, I especially like the state's argument that you don't, you, it's not a privacy violation if you don't know <laughs> that they violated your privacy. No, this is, this is deeply disturbing on another level because they're saying that if you don't know your privacy was violated, then it wasn't violated. It's like, okay, by that logic, you could search somebody's house. Suppose you had a device like a microwave scanner or like one of those airport scanners, like the naked scanners. Suppose you had one of those that would fit in a van. Well, by that logic, you could search somebody's house electronically with one of these things because they wouldn't know you're searching their, their house, and you could get contraband. That is no different of an argument, and that's that's how disingenuous that argument is. Well, you know what's funny? Uh, if you guys can go and watch the C-SPAN um, argument right here, uh, what's funny to me is that when the guy says it, he, to- he, he totally believes it. And the, guy, the other guy's response is like, no, if a tree falls in the woods, it still makes a noise, and it, it doesn't even, like... The guy can't put two and two together. What's the Republican? Um, uh, was it Mike Mike Rogers, the Republican? But who would be complaining? Somebody whose privacy was violated. You can't have your Rogers was saying yeah, Rogers you can't says. have your privacy violated if you don't know your privacy is violated. And it's like what? This so that a, that means that professor. I mean a law professor. Even absent even absent technology, you know, SEAL Team Six with you know cloth gloves and you know cloth booties on their shoes could go in your house and search through your stuff and as long as you didn't know that they were there that's okay that's what he's saying i mean how how did we how did we get here how do how did how are these jokers in power this is crazy uh, let's uh, I'll, I'll make it really basic every year while you're asleep you eat several spiders they <laughs> crawl into your nose and you eat them because your body just has a natural reaction so while you're sleeping you're eating spiders Everyone out there eats spiders. Now, you don't know that you eat spiders. Does that mean that they're not in your stomach? S- same argument. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to bring it know. all the way down to that basic level. If a spider goes into your nose and you swallow it while you're asleep, is it really in your stomach? Okay, Mark Rogers, answer that one. Uh, let's talk about a little bit of hardware. There's not much going on in the hardware world, but Intel has decided that they're going to start fabricating ARM processors. What the hell? Intel okay. making ARM processors? So I thought they were like 80, x86, and now the x86 you know, power consumption and performance is almost as good as the ARM processors' power sum- consumption and, and performance. Why on earth would they need to make ARM processors? Dollars to donuts. It's going to be an Atom that has an ARM core and an x86 core. Because you get the x86 for all the wild stuff and the ARM stuff for all the, the not-so-wild stuff, the straightforward all the, stuff. All the ultra-low-power stuff. I mean, how cool would that be? The other thing is that uh, their fabric- fabrication labs, they wanted to make sure that they could use them more often. Right now they're saying that um, you know, they're nowhere uh, near using their fabrication labs as, as much as they, as they could be. All right, so there's some breakthrough research going on in the world of light. Now, first off, um, some scientists at Santa Barbara's Solid State Lighting and Engine and Energy Center, so they've um, figured out how to just make lights way brighter. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about Li-Fi because there's been some breakthroughs in Li-Fi. Uh, UK scientists have been able to transmit 10 gigabits per second using light waves, not Wi-Fi, which is radio waves, using light waves. And... They do, it, they do it using LED lights that flicker um, at, at a rate at which you can't even see with your eyes. So your eyes think that the lights are on. I wonder if this is going to cause like headaches from all the, all the flickering. I, I don't know. I would hope that the flickering is in the terahertz range. And if that's the case, then no, it's not going to cause a headache. Yeah, you, you, won't even, you're, you can't even see it with your naked eyes. Um, now, the reason that it's so fast is because you know, like the, uh, the Wi-Fi range is it, it's, it's radio waves, and that's a small... Uh, range compared to the visible light spectrum it's 10,000 times bigger so that's why it's going to be so much uh so much better just well here's here's the thing here's this is something the audience should pay attention to anybody that tells you that um lte or 5 gigahertz or 10 gigahertz something like that is good enough for the last mile internet service is selling you a bill of goods that is not true the physics of that makes that impossible however with light-based technologies like this, it may be possible to actually deliver internet, last-mile internet, optically. But that means that you have like a laser on your house with a CMOS sensor, and then there's a CMOS sensor 
on the uh, you know on the utility pole or whatever because they can pack in you know tens of millions or hundreds of millions or billions of optical sensors on like a CMOS sensor and so everybody could literally have their own receiver in an optical type situation but with a radio situation it is not happening and i wonder if uh you know since it's visible light spectrum i wonder if like rain fog uh different you know conditions would affect that yeah oh yeah 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 i mean if it's if it's really foggy you're not going to have internet but i'm not going to say it's like the best last mile situation but uh it's probably a better more realistic last mile situation because with radio waves pretty much the only thing you can do is time division multiplexing you there's not really a lot else you can do to avoid interference with the optics you can pack in a lot more signals into a lot smaller area with optics yeah they're mass and it's massively parallel as well so that's it's really fast but i don't know i mean if if the the climate can can affect it and the uh, the outside weather conditions can affect it they've got to figure out something around that i, I don't know this uh, this know. article is more about using it, you know, in your house and things like that. And if all your light fixtures are on a network, I could see that. That could maybe happen. Like, can you imagine, like, a city that, well, like, New York City by 20, I think it's by 2015, they're going to have all 250,000 of, uh, of their city light poles replaced with LED lights. Can you imagine if they replace those all uh, with LED lights that could transmit 10 gigabits per second all over the city? That would be pretty cool. That, that would be amazing. Maybe that'll be in our future. We'll just be able to walk around and... Wherever there's lights, we're picking up the internet. And then I'm sure there'll be technologies to fill in the gaps as well. Um, science, thorium, how about it? Thorium as fuel. They're doing it in Norway. And um, Hans Blix says the world should develop thorium as its next fuel source. And I, I've been screaming this for years. Thorium is, is better than, than most things out there. But I, I think solar is probably the ultimate because you're just pulling energy from the sun. You get the solar panels once and then they just continue to soak up energy but thorium is clean and um and you can't make bombs out of thorium that makes <laughs> that makes a the lot of people of in america thorium. angry like well we don't want to build that we can't make bombs out of that there, there's a really nice poster somebody did of how awesome thorium is and it's got you know like thor in the corner we need to show that what element is it 90 electrons and 90 protons in the 1960s and 70s a prototype molten salt reactor was developed and tested by the united states at the oak ridge national lab which is in tennessee based on the msr technology an experimental reactor was built to study thorium fluoride salt and it kept salt hot enough to be liquid showing the elimination for the costly fabrication of fuel rods you know the problem with thorium uh in the United States and possibly in other places of the world, the hippies and the protesters and the environmental people, they freak out just because it's nuclear. And after you say it's, you know, it's nuclear, I've, I've had conversations with some friends of mine and I start talking, as soon as I'm in you know, thorium, they're like, what's thorium? I was like, oh, it's a type of nuclear. And as soon as that comes out of my mouth, they, their brain shuts off, their bandana <laughs> tightens to the point where they, they're squeezing, you know, all the life out of their brain. They can't hear anything I say. It's like talking to a wall at that point because I said nuclear. So maybe we need to, to, you know, just say that it's not not nu- not not say that it's not nuclear. Just like brand it in a different way. Just clean power thorium. <laughs> if we just say clean power thorium and don't say, you know, nu- nuclear, everything will be fine. Nuclear. The, nuclear. The amazing thing is that thorium is four times as common as uranium and five thousand more com- times more common than gold, and it has enhanced proliferation resistance. LF uh, lifters are seen as weapons proliferation resistant because uranium-233, a fissionable material that can be used to build weapons produced in a lifter, is inevitably contaminated with uranium-232, which needs to be separated from the 233 in order to create a bomb-friendly material. This is too bad for us. That means we'll probably never get any thorium reactors unless we can build bombs out of it. Yeah, pretty much. It'll be uranium and plutonium all over the place. What we can do, guys, as people of... uh, (laughs) <laughs> better not, of better information just <laughs> when you're talking to your friends just mention thorium especially your friends that are not on the internet that much and especially your friends that care about the environment uh and you know really hate coal power and nuclear power and all that sort of thing just educate them on the ways of thorium so that we can spread the good vibes and maybe we'll end up uh switching over to thorium like the liquid fluoride thorium reactor we could fit like six of those in this building that's crazy it only requires like three thousand square feet and a normal nuclear plant is like three hundred thousand square feet so everybody could have their own like thorium reactor in the basement 
Yeah, pretty much. Well, their own thorium <laughs> reactor in the basement that would power the entire neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just we just plug up to Steve down the street here. He's got a thorium <laughs> reactor under his house. <laughs> you know, DARPA actually does have variable um, nuclear reactors that run on uranium-232 for, you know, like setting up remote stations and things like that. They just dig a hole and bury it, and it's good for like 10 years, and it's like 5 megawatts. MIT is MIT. <laughs> <laughs> I said that funny. MIT is working on a wristband that could make your power bill go down. It's just a wristband that keeps you cool in that one spot. And the fact that it keeps you a little bit cool can make your entire body feel more tolerant to higher temperatures. And therefore, you could raise the heat in your house and save the country billions a year. Uh, it's pretty ugly. In it's the like putting a cold right rag now. on your forehead. Yeah, exactly. Just it's exactly what it is. And that's just not very stylish these days, you know. Maybe we should maybe we should bring that in to style. Just always keep a towel in the freezer and then swap one out every couple hours. And if you save. had that, you could stay in the heat being you know a degree or the air conditioner being a degree or two warmer, or you know the heat being a degree or two lower. This is like the hippie section of the show right now. It's fun. <laughs> Let's move on and talk about some games, shall we? Steam now has sixty-five million active users. It's uh, bigger than Xbox Live. Did you ever think that Steam would be bigger than Xbox Live? We knew it would be bigger than Xbox Live. Yeah. I, I've, I've felt like consoles have been on their way out for a long time. Especially when I started seeing them transition into the set-top one box of Magic Everything. I was like, hey, the PC already is a one box of Magic Everything. It's just a little big and bulky and ugly and scary. But after we get it you know, smaller and cuter and more friendly so that anyone can just plug it up in their living room like a Steam box, then uh, the consoles are probably going to go away. So, yeah, it's, uh, that, that, that happened. And also, uh, the PC gaming is the fastest growing uh, sector of gaming in the UK. I didn't have an article wow. about that. I just, I just heard some guy say it on a bus or something. I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, speaking of PC games and also indie games, a couple guys from, I think they're in the Ukraine, are working on a game called Reset. And uh, they've, they've created their own engine in-house. And that's what's crazy. It's just a couple guys working on this game. The graphics are ridiculous. Like, they're beyond Crisis. They're beyond uh, Unreal Tournament. And now they've released the first gameplay, um, gameplay trailer. The original trailer was, in my opinion, it's slightly more, uh, I guess, it just looked a little bit better than this one does. But they, they both look really damn good. I, I recommend you guys go over and check that out for sure. Um, Telltale Games may be working on a uh, a game in the Star Wars universe. That's just what happened in the Reddit AMA. The uh, Telltale game founders, uh, Dan Connors and Kevin Bruner, said they might be working on a Star Wars game. They alluded to it. They wanted to work on some big properties. They already they did The Wolf Among Us, and they also did The Walking Dead, and they're working on the new Walking Dead game. And they did a bunch of crap games before that, but they hired some good writers, I guess, like Gary Whitta and a few other people. So. Uh, another freaking Star Wars game, but this one done by them. I, I liked them because they always did the mature, tough stories, and they didn't pull the punches that much, I felt. Uh, I liked the Back games. to the Future. The They did the Back to the Future sort of like miniseries. It, it wasn't amazing, but it yeah. was pretty good. It was a lot of fun. You know, I really think that they handle mature subject matter better, like brutal stuff like, you know, The Walking Dead where anybody can die. And, you know, there's just, you know, rated R material. That's what I, that's what I feel like, so I'm not sure how... Star Wars will will do, because you can't be totally brutal with Star Wars, or can you? That's eh, Disney now, damn it. <laughs> it went from George Lucas to Disney. Oh, well. I liked how it was like the Knights of the Old Republic. You had, like, the assassin droids. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was probably the most mature that Star Wars has ever been, I, I think. It's, like, the most adult. But even then, it was just a more sophisticated story than possibly some of the, especially some of the new movies, it was a more sophisticated story. Anyway, that's pretty much all we've got today. Um, don't forget to check out the store. We do have um, some new products in, like our, our um, awesome pint glasses are in with the logo on them. And we got girl shirts. And, of course, we restocked everything else. And I had to, I had to call again and order even more because as soon as we restocked, I was like, oh, it's almost gone already. So you guys are awesome. Uh, also, don't forget, if you're looking for game deals, techsyndicate.com slash game deals. And we always try to keep you guys 
up to date on different game deals out there. Sometimes you'll save a lot of money even over the different Steam sales. But we'll, we'll talk about Steam sales on there too. That's enough of this. I will uh, see you guys next time. All the links are in the description. All the other stuff is in the description. There's a lot of junk to click on. So just click on it. And um, yeah, you guys are awesome. I'll see you next week. Thank you.